All right, so our next speaker this morning is Cynthia Ibrahim, who comes to us from San Diego State, where she'll be a rising senior this year. Um, Cynthia has been working over the summer with Greg, and she's gonna tell us today about her project, searching for evidence of galaxy interaction near quasars. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Gwen, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to kind of take you guys through what I've been working on this summer. Uh, so first, let's start off with some basic terminology that uh, you're going to hear me talk a lot during this presentation. Um, so first, things such as what is a quasar? Um, what is redshift? Uh, so let's start off with what is a quasar? Um, a quasar is basically a galaxy that contains an extremely luminous black hole, and it has matter accreting onto it from an accretion disk. Now, quasars, they're super massive. They're almost a billion times more massive than our sun. And another thing that we should know about quasars um, is that because they're super luminous, sometimes when we look at them uh, through telescopes, they tend to outshine their own galaxies. So they could be about 100 times more brighter than their host galaxies. Uh, another feature that it is possible that these quasars can have um, are jets or radio lobes, which come out from either side of the quasar, and that happens when the gas interacts around the galaxy. And now um, on this image on the left that you guys might have been looking at, uh, this is an example of what redshift is. And uh, to put it simply, redshift helps us track the expansion of the universe. So as we see in this photo on the left, um, where, the, right, where uh, the light waves are moving towards the red end of the spectrum and they appear to be stretching, meaning that something is moving away from, from, uh, from us. So if something was moving towards us, the wavelengths would uh, look shorter and not stretched out. So there's a, are some two terminology that we'll keep in mind as we go through. But now let's discuss uh, why, why are we even looking into this? What is the motivation? So we use the CGM as a probe for galaxy evolution. Now the, circum, the CGM stands for circumgalactic medium and it's this gaseous um, space around a galaxy. It also can span up to roughly the virial radius, which is about 250 kiloparsecs. Um, and this is dependent on mass, but right now we're just using a rough, uh, a rough estimate because we don't have the masses of our systems. Uh, so the CGM, it's a great place to investigate because it's a source of gas to fuel star formation and also a potential ground for interactions such as um, galaxy mergers, that kind of stuff. Now, by studying the CGM, um, we're able to ask a lot of questions. One of these questions can be, does the CGM have cool gas present? And um, does this cause the quasar to become more luminous? And we could do that um, by directly looking at the nature of the gas in this area. Another thing that it helps us understand, as the title says, uh, is galaxy evolution, because um, you know it's where gas cools and it falls onto the galaxies. Um, it feeds molecular clouds, which in turn helps drive uh, star formation. So really, by looking um, at this area, we can also start to look at galaxy star formation rates nearby, and then ask the questions: uh, Is it enhanced? Is it normal star formation rates? Um, does it tend to have a low star, for star formation rate, and why is that? Uh, so this figure on the left is just to better visualize these words that I've been saying. So we have the virial radius, um, also known as the rough boundary of the CGM, and we have two quasars in our fields. This is from our field HST um, ACS, and so in every field that we look at, we have two quasars, the foreground and the background. Um, our focus is the foreground quasar, and as we see, it's at redshift uh, z equals 0.7. The foreground quasar we use to measure the distances from this quasar to other galaxies, just so we could find out how far away they are. And the background quasar, the main purpose of that is uh, that it allows us to probe the gaseous environment, so the CGM of the foreground quasar. So it's really, um, in other words, it's used as a flashlight on our foreground quasar. And then we have um, galaxies here that I circled in blue. Um, one of them most notably is the one on the bottom right, which is at redshift 0.73. And that's within the range um, of our quasar that, we're, that we really wanna focus on. Um, so, so that's of importance that we'll see later on. Now, why, why are we looking at star formation rates? Um, this is something 
special. Um, we're looking at star formation rates, specifically um, hoping to find enhanced star formation rates as it could be an indicator of interaction with a galaxy. So um, this is also known as the starburst phase. Now, some great tracers that we can look at are the Balmer series. Um, so this is like H alpha, H beta. And something else that we're also looking at uh, are oxygen to emission lines. Now, um, something to keep in mind is that at redshifts uh, greater than Z equals 0.5, the H alpha tends to redshift out of the optical and we're only left with H beta and oxygen 2. Uh, so for example, in the case of H beta, it could be much weaker than oxygen 2 um, due to dust in the galaxy or low star formation rates. And I mentioned specifically the optical wavelength because that's how we're retrieving our data. Our spectra is in the optical wavelength. Now on the bottom, uh, I put this image from Hopkins and it's just to just for us to better visualize uh, specific predictions as for what to expect on how quasi-stellar objects are formed. So for example, in this figure, um, we start off with an isolated galaxy in a small group, and that eventually leads to part C, which is the interaction slash merger phase. Um, and when this happens, you know, this can lead to higher star formation rates. And later on in this model, when the merging becomes more intense, the black hole begins to grow rapidly and a quasar can be all what's left behind. Uh, so this really shows us a good example of galaxy evolution and how it kind of ties into looking at this environment around a quasar. Now, how are we finding star formation rates? Uh, let's start off with first for um, where we got our data from and the fields, how we view them. We view our fields through the DS9 image tool um, with observed fields using HST and the ACS. We have the optical spectra obtained for 19, 19 different fields with Magellan and LDSS3. Now, as we see in this figure on the left, uh, this is galaxy spectra from the SDSS specific field 084331. Um, we see that it also is able to read in the redshift. Uh, so this specific galaxy um, is actually within the quasars range that we're looking for um, in this field. So this is um, something that we would pay really close attention to. Now, looking at this figure, um, we see prominent lines like oxygen 2, H beta, oxygen 3. Um, and by obtaining the flux of these lines, which we do through our spectra code, we can later plug that into our step one, which is computing the line luminosity. And after we get this line luminosity, uh, we then use the SFR equation from Kenica and Cooley to determine the star formation rates. Um, and then once we do that, you know, we can determine whether it's normal enhanced star formation rates or if it seems to be relatively low for the redshift it's at. And this is meant to just highlight uh, the wealth of information that we gain from looking at optical spectroscopy. Um, and, you know, it enables us to detect emission lines such as oxygen 2, oxygen 3, um, H alpha and H beta. Now specifically, Let's look at our case study um, of, this, of this specific field from SDSS, and that's uh, the 084331. Now, we investigated many different galaxies um, in this quasar field using HST slash ACS imaging and the LDSS3 spectroscopy. And as we see um, in this plot on the left, we found only seven galaxies within the redshift range of the QSO, and that was at um, Z equals 0.7. So this is one of the quasar fields selected to have full gas. Uh, so a magnesium two absorption was detected. And we might expect to find evidence of a merger. Now using oxygen two um, in this example, we can estimate their star formation rates as a function of distance to the quasar. Now we see most of these galaxies um, fall within the minimum star formation main sequence uh, from Noskis. And um, this, this just shows us that within this field, we don't see anything enhanced or crazy going on um, in regards to star formation rates. Uh, but something that is curious is on the bottom left of the plot, we have a star formation galaxy at around 200 kiloparsecs. Um, and that's below the minimum expected for, for this redshift range. Uh, so that's really curious because, you know, we could ask, is it possible that an interaction occurred in the past, um, something, potentially at a much longer time scale or, or maybe something's going on right now. 
Um, and the uh, image on the right is just to show us um, how we found this minimum star formation main sequence line. Um, it's just a rough estimate of the lower and upper limits um, and uh, of, of what um, rates are expected at this specific redshift. So although we didn't find um, any like enhanced star formation rates uh, between distance and like galaxies and stuff, uh, you know, it was curious to see this specific galaxy at 200 kiloparsecs. And also, um, it leads us to what our future work will be, is really just at continuing to look at more fields, um, hoping that there's more galaxies within a certain range of the quasar, and asking questions like, is there a relationship between the galaxy distance from the quasar and star formation rates or metallicity? Metallicity is something that we'll definitely be looking at in the future. Um, is it normal, enhanced, or below average? And can we find evidence of interaction or mergers between these galaxies, um, specifically within the virial radius or the CGM boundary of quasars? And again, would this be evidence of star formation or um, quiescence? That's all, thank you. Nice job, Cynthia. Any questions for Cynthia about her project? Uh, go ahead. And this is John. I have a question, which I, I'm just wondering about this this galaxy that's too, the close one. Have you looked at it? I mean, what does it look like? Yeah, have we looked at it? What its morphology is, for instance, or something like that relating yeah, to that's, the last? That's a great question. Um, looking at the galaxy morphology on the fields is something that we um, do intend to in, incorporate into our future work. Um, but for right now, we were really just focusing on the spectra. But it would be definitely curious to go back and look at Really, is there something weird going on that maybe we missed and we weren't able to detect from the spectra? So that's a great idea. Thank you. Sure. Great talk. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions for Cynthia? Very nice job, Cynthia. Thank you.